Can you hear us, Margo? I can. Thank you. I just got on. It's taking me a while. I apologize. No, no, you're okay. All right. Okay, everyone. Um, it's 5.30. Mr. Chair, if you'd like to call the meeting to order. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Ward 1 Neighborhood Advisory Board meeting. It is, it is today. Today is... May 13th, it's 5.30. Uh, can I get a roll call, please? Yes, Mr. Chair. Bill Shrimp. Here. Member Piskovich. Here. Wager. Here. Warning House. Here. And we have had one appointment since this agenda was posted. Jim Milligan. Here. Present. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, you can call. Ooh, and Council Liaison Jenny Breckis, absent at this time. Mr. Chair, you have a form of the Ward 1 Neighborhood Advisory Board. Ooh, that is wonderful. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, let's start with uh, going to A2, public comments. Uh, for those who do want to make a public comment, uh, Tyler will go over some of the other rules. But one of the quirks of being in this room is this is our one microphone. We have people in Zoom land. So if you'd like to make a public comment, please come over here somewhere so the people in Zoom land can hear you. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Our first item today is public comment. Members of the public may hear, observe, and provide public comment virtually by registering to the following link, which can be found on reno.gov slash meetings. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash L I N K S period R E N O period G O B forward slash three capital T capital F H D capital R capital O. Comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may not pertain to matters or and may pertain to matters both on and off the NAB's agenda. The NAB may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda. When you're called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. If you're an attendee in the Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. And Mr. Chair, our first public commenter today is our police chief, Chief Nance. Hi, everybody. I'm going to stand over by the owl so I don't get in trouble, but I'm very <laughs> close to my new friends here. Uh, I'm Catherine Nance, and I like this, at least I'm facing one way. Last time I was talking to people behind me, too, so this is actually a better uh, point for me. Uh, so I've been here since February of last year, so a little bit over a year, and I'm making my rounds at the different NAPs, just introducing myself, giving kind of an overview of what we're doing, and then some exciting things uh, that we're looking forward to. So, um, you know, just really excited to be here and to get to know everybody and to start being a part of this group. I know you guys get law enforcement officers in here quarterly to provide some information and data. And I'm actually going to start with that. One of the things that we're working on right now is our information and data releases. So when I got here, we were very far behind on our public records releases and uh, entering information into the National Crime Incident-Based System. And we were almost two years behind, in some cases, three years behind. And so a lot of the information that we had wasn't necessarily being um, exported accurately because it hadn't been imported all the way yet. So we're now at a place where we're caught up. We're caught up at the end of the month. By the 15th of the following month, we can start putting that information out and it's accurate and complete and in totality. So I'm really proud of my record staff that worked so hard to get that done. A lot of restructuring, working with the city clerk's office, but we did. It was one of my big goals and they, they did it in about six months. So it's been great. So how that affects you uh, in a couple different ways is one is that if we are, when we put out information and in crime data, you are getting the most accurate up-to-date crime data. The only difference is we can't get it until the 15th of the following month. So we're always a little bit behind, but it's always up to date and accurate, which is great. So we're looking at how we're pu publishing that information. And one of the things that we're looking at is putting more detailed, better information out quarterly. So you're not just getting numbers, but you're actually getting maybe some comparisons. 
and making it more impressionable to what you're interested in in the group. So your information that you might get here might not be the same as another NAB is getting probably overall the same, but you might have different things as a group that you want to see more. And then as able to push that out quarterly will help make it a better usable document and have officers here to explain it. So that's one of our big goals right now. Uh, so you'll see that upcoming in the next fiscal year because I'm probably, hopefully, uh, looking at hiring another crime analyst. So I'll be able to work on getting that information out better. A few other really exciting things that we have. We are uh, working with a consulting group. Some of you might have either attended a meeting. I see some, some familiar faces here for that on how we're deploying our resources more effectively throughout the city. Uh, we've identified some discrepancies in call load and call volume in different neighborhoods and areas, and where response time might not be as um, as rapid as we would like it to be because the districts aren't divided the way that they should. So we're looking at redistricting. Uh, to my knowledge, the Reno Police Department has not redistricted ever, forever. I don't know that they ever have. So it's a really old way of doing things, and everybody here knows how fast the city has grown north and south and how the population's changed. So we have to look at how we're deploying our resources. So that's one of the big studies that we're working on now, and we're going to start redeploying to make sure that we're having consistency in how we're deploying resources regardless of where you live. So the timing will be uh, more proportionate throughout. And then we're also with that looking at what our staffing needs should be in the patrol realm. Uh, another question I get a lot of is when are we moving? Because we are moving. Uh, the new building should be done in July. We should start assembling furniture in July and we'll start moving in mid-summer. Tentatively, we have a ribbon cutting scheduled for the second week in August and then we will start using that and moving our resources in there. I want to be out before fall snow happens. I really want to be out before Thanksgiving. Um, I want to be out by uh, Halloween, but I don't know if I'm going to make it. And, uh, but I'm, we are moving out in the fall. So we, uh, we're gonna work really hard on getting over the new building. And I'm very excited for that space because we have parking. So if you've ever been to the police department, there is no parking. If you walk in the lobby, you have this much space, pretty much like this, yes. we're talking to the owl, um, it, with everybody there. And here we're gonna have room for uh, over 50 parking stalls for the public and many different spaces, both to use for community presentations or for meetings and trainings that we wanna host. And also places, if you have to make a police report, you can go in and do that privately where you're not standing in the lobby talking in front of anybody else who walks in. So that's kind of forward facing stuff that I'm really excited about. And the, uh, the employee resources and areas in that building are phenomenal for officers. So I'm really looking at that being a very big morale and, um, wellness component for them. So that's going to be fun and exciting. Um, I don't think there was anything else I was going to touch on. I don't remember anything else I forgot no. about. Okay. You, but that's it. Just want to stop by and introduce myself. I will probably pop in at another time. And then again, just look forward to how we're going to start presenting information to you to so make sure that you're getting both the most up-to-date, accurate information and also information that's usable in a form that you guys want to see. So we can work on that through Tyler. If there's specific things that this group wants, we can make sure that we're providing that data and information now. So thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. That's true. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Okay. I don't have anyone else in the room who's registered to give public comment, but oops, look, there we go. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you so much. If you want to stand right about there, people can hear you. Well, I'm William Sandy Bangston. I have a couple of questions. I know they probably won't be answered here. But the first one is I'm in Ward 1 until I think the elections, and then I move to Ward 2, Naomi Dewar. My question is um, Naomi Dewar is running for the state senate. And I'm wondering when I look, I can't see anybody running for a Ward 2 council person. And so I'm wondering when I move to Ward 2 at election time, who might be representing me? That's my first question. Um, the second one is since I think this NAB, the last two were canceled, I think, three. Three. and three. <laughs> And during that time, there's been a lot of talk about rezoning and ADUs and all kinds of things. And the uh, council meeting in March, Devin Reese made a comment that 
ADUs, he doesn't have to worry about that because his HOA prohibits them. So I thought, well, you know, I live just on above Skyline. I don't have an HOA, um, but I do have CC and office. So I went to the recorder's office and I got my CCNRs, which were filed in 1960. They absolutely prohibit, prohibit a second house on the lot. They also prohibit any lots less than 14,000 square feet. And they also have rules with setbacks and sides and all that. So my question is, in, in, the, in the city, what did they call? They had a the city had something called it was called a clean initiative zoning and clean. One of the items said um, while the city of Reno does not enforce CCNRs, those restrictions would still be applicable and would trump the proposed zoning changes. So I'm guessing that at least my neighborhood, which is Skyline, Skyline Heights, Subdivision 1, all of most of those houses on the west side of um, Skyline, up to the canyon, are, are exempt from any zoning changes and um, ADUs. Um, and I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm guessing that that's what happens. So no answers here, but maybe Tyler and Tyler could provide some yeah. label. Thank you. I can clarify something. Yeah. So, uh, I'm not an attorney or anything. If you guys want to talk um, offline together, yeah, yeah. offline, yeah. that would be great. And yeah. just for the board, I will get with Sandra and make sure she gets some answers to her questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and absolutely, please do change phone numbers and stuff like that. I just wanted to. Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Sorry, for yeah. No, no, you're okay. no. It's okay. We just, the rules we have to follow. So. Is there anyone else who'd like to give public comment during the opening public comment? Can I period? respond to that? Do you have a comment, Margo? I do. Um, I did go to the meeting last Wednesday. I also have CCNRs, but they're actually called restrictions, and we are in. Um, Skyline, Skyline Crest number one. And I did find out today that if you do have those restrictions or anything, they do go with the property in perpetuity unless it's been changed in the last, hers are in the 60s, mine are in the 70s. So I think you're safe to understand, you know, that if you do have them, you're safe. Thanks, Marco. Is there anyone else in the room who'd like to give opening public comment? There'll be an opportunity for public comment on each of the items, as well as an opportunity for closing public comment. If there's anyone on Zoom who'd like to give public comment, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Mr. Chair, we have no further opening public comment. Okay. Um, I think the only change the agenda would be A6 since our, I'm sorry, A5 since our council liaison member's not here. Uh, Just skip that one. Other than that, any changes to the agenda? No, Mr. Chair, there's no changes to the agenda. Can I get a motion for approval, please? I'll okay. second. Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. I'll second. Second, second Carla. Thank you all. Approved. Yay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Right. Passed unanimously. Okay. Uh, this is to A4, approval of the minutes for possible action. Uh, has the members been able to review the minutes and are there any revisions or corrections that are necessary? Skim them quickly. I didn't see anything jumping out at me, but it's been a while. Yep. So, uh, Margo, anything? Looked okay to me, but I can't remember back to December 11th. <laughs> I think we're all in the same boat there. Someone would like to make a motion. Okay. Can you get a motion to approve them? I move to approve the minutes. Oh, I'll well. second it. Thank you, Carla. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. 
And I'll note for the record that our new member, James Milligan, abstained from the vote on the minutes since he wasn't at the last two meetings. All right. Jeez, where were you? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, it takes us to A6. Tyler, staff liaison report. Hello, everyone. My name is Tyler Shaw, community liaison with the city of Reno for the record. It's so great to see you all here at our Ward 1 Neighborhood Advisory Board meeting. Um, as the chair noted earlier, the board hasn't met since January, so we're really excited to get back into the swing of things. We have a new board member, Jim Milligan, so please welcome him to the Ward 1 now. It's going to be a great, uh, great opportunity to learn with the board. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, my only update is that our next Ward 1 Neighborhood Advisory Board meeting is on Monday, June 10th at the same time and place, which is 5.30 p.m. here at the McKinley Arts and Culture Center Boardroom, located at 925 Riverside Drive. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. I should use last name just to All right. And I believe it takes us into B1, our RTC Ward 1 General Project Updates. Right. Yes, yep. yes. yes. Please. in our presenter chair. And I know I've seen him before. I forgot your name. Paul. Oh, uh, thank you, Paul. For the record, Paul Nelson, Government Affairs Officer for RTC. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to present some of the projects that we've got going on here in World One. Uh, recognize a few of you guys from uh, being here about a year ago when I talked about the Brown event we put in there on 4th Street and uh, Woodland Avenue. So this is a lot more information. We have a lot of things going on, so we'll get to it. Uh, next slide, please. Can you speak up a little, Tom? Yeah. All right, so uh, the RTC board is made up of five elected leaders from the region. We've got one member from the city of Sparks. Ed Lawson is our chair. We've got two members from the Washoe County Board of Commissioners, and we've got two Reno City Council women. Our two uh, councilmen, we've got Devin Reese, we got Mayor Hillary Sheedy, and we also have uh, Tracy Larkin Thomason is an ex officio, she's the director of NDOT, and then Bill Thomas is our executive director. Slide. So our mission is building a better community through quality transportation, and we do that every single day, trying to improve the transportation system in our region. And we do that in three major ways. We're the Metropolitan Planning Organization, so we do all the long-term planning and the short-term planning of the region. And then second, we do the engineering and construction uh, of our regional roads. And then we also handle the transportation, the public transportation. Next. So with public transportation, our fixed route transit is known as RTC Ride. And this is really the backbone of our transit system. We had 5.1 million trips on our uh, bus routes in the last 12 months. 60% of those are for work-related trips. So we know how important our bus lines are for the economy and for people to get to and from work. We've also had 21 straight months of ridership growth. So we're really proud of that. And we're hoping to increase that even more in the coming months. So uh, we're really proud of our alternative fuels program. So originally we had planned on having a 100% alternative fuel fleet by 2035. We accomplished that in 2022. So 13 years ahead of schedule. That includes 23 all electric buses. So that's about one third of our fleet. The other two thirds are made up of hybrids. They're uh, diesel electric. And we just got our first two hydrogen fuel cell buses in December. Six more of them are on order. We should have those by the end of the year. And we are working on putting in a permanent hydrogen fueling facility sometime this year. So uh, one of our big successes has been our bus rapid transit. We kind of look at this almost like a kind of like a poor man's light rail. Uh, instead, it's it's not a train, it's a bus. We have the Virginia line and the Lincoln line. And between those two, we've got about 1.4 million rides that we have every year. And that's 27% of our entire uh, ridership. So we've got 20 routes, two of them provide 27% of the rides. And what I was saying about the light rail, the poor man's light rail system, we uh, service approximately every 10 minutes. So frequency is really the key to success with this program. So uh, during COVID and we had a couple of bus strikes, we did lose a lot of ridership. So we've been really working on creative ways to improve our transit system. 
And one of those that's been very successful is our FlexRide program. It's our on-demand curb-to-curb service. We operate in four different zones, and that's Sparks, Spanish Springs, Fort Valley, Somerset and Verdi, and the South Meadows. So a closer look at those zones, you can see Spanish Springs and North Valleys. The way this works is you can get on the app and you can order a flex ride, kind of like an Uber or a Lyft. It'll be there generally in around 20 minutes, sometimes less, sometimes more. And you can get picked up on in any area in this zone. It'll take you anywhere else within this zone. It'll also drop you off at a bus stop so you can get on our fixed route and give you access to the rest of the cities. So that's Spanish Springs and North Valleys. And on the next ones, We've got Somerset and Verdi, and just uh, last week, May 4th, we launched our fourth zone, that's South Meadows. And you can see on that map, there's a few areas outside of that big zone, and those are points of interest that people need to get to. So we've got the DMV, we've got some grocery stores, we've got the Summit Mall, and the Redfield campus down below. So there's uh, a lot of opportunity for people that have been wanting more transit options in South Reno. There's just not a demand uh, in some of these areas, and that's why we offer the flex ride. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other really successful programs that we're proud of. We've got the Senior Ride Taxi Bucks program, and that's a $60 subsidy for seniors, veterans, people with disabilities. They get a card that auto loads every month. So you can use these for Uber, Lyft, or taxi rides. And once you run out, you run out. But at the following month, it reloads for another $60. It does not run over them. Uh, the Vancouver program is another one that we're really excited about. Uh, we've seen a lot of popularity and a lot of growth in this program. This is a, a carpool program for people that work together. So Enterprise Rental Car will provide a van. I believe it's five to 15 people. So you can get a smaller SUV like this, or you can get a large van. And RTC will provide a subsidy. And some employers also provide a subsidy. The, the designated driver of these vans, they uh, have the opportunity to use it as a personal car. And because of the subsidies, it really doesn't cost them very much at all. And um, we have 340 vans, sixth largest fleet in the country, which uh, we think for a, a city our size is, is yeah, it's pretty uh, impressive. And the reason for that is because we've got so many long commutes. We've got a lot of people working out of Trick. We've got people working out in Susanville, Lake Chicago, Truckee, Carson City. So uh, we think that's one of the reasons why we've got so much success with this program. And just last year, this, this uh, the Vancouver program saved 20 million miles traveled on our regional roadways. So if you think about the, uh, the amount of pollution and the amount of uh, just the number of cars on the roads, this really does have a pretty big impact. Before we move on, Paul, I think one of the members had a question. Two questions. Uh, what is the eligibility for the senior ride program? I think it's 60, 60 and above. Uh, there's no income eligibility? No. Again, and uh, I'm curious about the, the van pool. What does that cost uh, to utilize? It depends on the subsidies. So the RTC provides the subsidies. And then let's say you work for, I think that if you work for a government agency, so if you live in Reno and you go down to Carson City and work for the National Guard, say, they'll provide uh, the subsidy as well. Um, and then if it's a private employer, or uh, then they can also provide whatever they feel like. So, or they don't need to either. Uh, the second prong of our, uh, the three things we do is uh, planning. And right now we're working on a regional transportation plan. We do this every four years. We are updating the 2050 regional transportation plan. And this is our long-term outlook. It's looking 20 plus years into the future about what we want our transportation system to look like. And one of the big things that we want to really do is capture the community's vision of what they want to see, and then we can identify the projects and programs and the services that are necessary to achieve that vision. And we plan on uh, implementing this in spring of next year. The RTC, other member entities, and NDOT can all implement uh, these uh, identified programs. Next. Uh, the South Virginia TOD study, that's a transit-oriented development. We we do a lot of studies, and this one in particular, the boundary is South Virginia Street from Meadowood Mall to the Summit Mall, so about five and a half miles. And it takes a look at all of this developable land that uh, we want to develop it in a way where it can provide walkable uh, neighborhoods, bikeable neighborhoods, and possibly give us enough demand between 
uh, the amount of housing, businesses that we could possibly extend our Virginia VRT from Meadowood Mall down to the Summit Mall. So this also takes a look at previous projects like red development. If you think of something like that, if we could develop something on a, probably a smaller scale down in South Bay, what would that do for transit and for walkability, bikeability, and then also uh, the future downtown of the area? So the active transportation plan, this is what we call walk and roll Truckee Meadows. And this is really studying uh, how we can improve things for bicyclists and pedestrians. And this is part of our RTP. We want input from all ages. So anyone from eight years old to 80 years old. And uh, the things that we really look at are sidewalks and bicycle facilities. So that could include bike paths, bike lanes, multi-use paths, things like that. And we analyze existing data when it comes to transit, equity, safety, bicycle level of stress, and the pedestrian experience index. Thanks. We're also in the middle of a freight plant. So if you look at that map to the right, you can see the red. That's where we have our highest truck volumes. We obviously have a lot more freight now than we did maybe 15 years ago because of all the, the warehousing that has moved in, all the manufacturing that has moved in. Yeah. So what we're doing is trying to foster a thriving and diverse economy in Northern Nevada, and we want to identify and support the needed infrastructure investments. That could be anything from capacity improvements to truck parking. We hear a lot about, a lot of times people might get stuck here during a snowstorm and there's just not a available parking. For them. So there's a lot of different things we're looking at. So engineering, that's our third prong of what we do. And last year, fiscal year 2023, we invested $87 million and that accounted for 2,600 jobs in the construction industry. Now, some of the recently completed projects here in Ward 1 include the 4th Street and Woodland Avenue Roundabout. This is, uh, it also includes a retaining wall on the north end, made roadway improvements, one of the things that we really try to do with all of our major projects is we try to make things safer and easier for all modes of transportation. And that's what we did here. There used to be a lot of issues with uh, people trying to get out into 4th Street. There were stop signs, but then there's also a lot of people speeding and that's always been an issue on East 4th Street. So putting in this roundabout, removed those conflict points. There have been some pretty severe accidents uh, along this area. When you put roundabouts in, statistically, it reduces crashes by about 30%. And then the ones that do happen usually are a lot less severe because it takes away those head-on and T-bone crashes. And they're also going a lot slower because they're going down into the roundabout. This also included eight-foot multi-use paths and house walks. And it was a $5.2 million, $5 million project. No taxpayer funding was needed for this project because it was paid for by what we call uh, regional road impact fees. And those are fees that developers pay, I think it's 5,200 bucks per unit that we end up using to improve the transportation that is necessary because of these projects. So other things we have coming up this year, traffic signal modification. So there's a handful of them you can see in Ward 1. This could be anything from signal timing to infrastructure improvements with the, the lights themselves, the poles, the posts, or ADA improvements. So uh, one of the biggest projects we have- uh, Paul, Jerry, ahead. I want to remember, go ahead, Jerry. Okay. I thought you were putting a stoplight on Moana at the pool. Moana and Baker, yes. There is a stoplight going in there. They've got the uh, the post set up right now. I think they just need to install the light, the, the poles and, and the lights themselves. And when will that be operation? I don't have a date, but it shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't be too much longer. I think it I don't know if it's electrical or or what right now, but that is a fairly short project. Any other questions? All right, so uh, the Arlington Avenue bridges replacement, you guys might be familiar with this. Uh, we're replacing two structurally deficient bridges. That doesn't mean they're not safe. They are safe to drive on. It's just they're old and it's time to replace them. So we plan on replacing these two bridges in 25 and 26, approximately $30 million. Jerry, um, we could talk about this for a second. Um, I've been through the past public meetings that were held largely Zoom because of COVID. 
and uh, looking at the environmental issues that were brought up, uh, as well as the safety issues. And uh, it seemed to me you were concerned about the safety of pedestrians, kayakers, and bicycles. But nowhere in all of that uh, record could I see a mention of the safety for small children utilizing the river in the summer of 2025 when you're proposing to make the South Channel more dangerous for them. Are you talking about when we close off the, I, uh, one of the channels? Yes. Yeah, I, I can answer that. Uh, so, Amanda Calgary, RTC engineer manager, for the record, um, the all of Bloomfield Park will be closed during the construction, so it'll be fenced off from both sides of Bloomfield Park, um, both First Street and Island Avenue, and so there will be no access from the adjacent roadways in order to get into the park. So the only um, people that will end up in the river there um, are kayakers. We have included in our contract um, a pretty robust package of um, advanced warning signs at all the key main entrance points, um, parks upstream of Arlington Avenue to notify um, river users of um, work going on downstream, and we also um, are going to have a robust outreach campaign um, moving into next summer when the work is planned to begin. So you're saying there'll be no access from Barbara Hannon Park. Correct. There will be no access to Wingfield Park. So period. From either side of from the. From either side. Yeah. Yep. It will be shut down for so. Um, Originally, it was supposed to be closed for two years. However, um, the, the RTC um, explored the use of a, a CMAR contract delivery method, so a construction manager at risk. And we have brought Granite Construction on board and worked with them to expedite that schedule and implement different innovations in order to um, speed up that construction schedule. And currently, that two year schedule has been reduced to one. So the park will only be um, impacted for an anticipated uh, one year. And that is all based on weather, right? If we get a severe weather event and have to remove a, um, a river diversion from from the site, then there's always a chance that it could go into that second year, but the way we have planned it and designed it um, will hopefully... So there's, there's no possibility of small children using the South Channel in the summer of 2025? The only way a small child would get there is if they floated down the river from upstream. Okay. Yep, it will be secure. All the Kenvin bridges um, will be closed, uh, except for the exception of um, one egress point, and that's at the western nose of Wingfield Park. Um, so you'll be able to use that uh, west or most western head bridge in the north channel in order to um, get out, get off of the park, but it will be fenced from all other sides of the park, and there's no other way to get there other than through the river. Okay. How does that coincide with the renovations uh, plan for the park in Wingfield? And so that is a separate effort by the city of Reno. Are you talking about the Wingfield Master Plan? Yeah, so that could close out another year. I'm I'm not sure on the. I can send you some information on it, Sandra. I'll work with our city of Reno Parks Department. Like Amanda said, it's a separate project through them, but I'll get some info for you. And yeah. I just wonder if time yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So I, thank you. I want to say thank you for working on CMR and getting from two years to one year. That's definitely an improvement um, for sure. Uh, for my part, um, being all over the world, seeing big projects going on, I still don't understand why we closed the park for a whole year, the entire duration of construction, because we can walk next to big construction park projects all the time. And my understanding is, is aside from uh, uh, it is the second most utilized park in the city. And so to close it even for a year is pretty impactful. Um, so you're 50% better than you were, so that's super great. Yeah. But if there's a way to uh, balance the, the, definitely some safety concerns, of course, yeah. but big cities do this stuff all the time. This is, this is not new. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. Um, 
I think safety is our number one concern. Uh, secondly, we're using the entire eastern portion of the park as a lay down yard with access points. So um, it's not available for public use. And second of all, we only have four months to construct these two bridges. Um, we there is we we can't um, take any risk for um, for modifying the design or modifying our schedule in any way to allow that. Um, we are working very um, we're working simultaneously um, in many areas. And we have to get one bridge done, at least the substructure, uh, which are the, the foundation, the piers, um, our girders in before we can remove that river diversion, put flow through it while we work on the other bridge. And simultaneously to doing that, okay. we are going to be working on a superstructure. So the bridge deck, the bridge railing, at the same time concurrently to the other bridge construction. So there are no be no way for anyone to access um, the park. So there's a couple reasons I will clarify. Okay. No, I, I appreciate you guys working on that. I'm happy to see the bridges coming through. So thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Keep going. So uh, we did go out into the community. We had a couple of meetings about this, and we really wanted their input to find out what they wanted this bridge to look like, or these bridges, I should say. So what we came up with, like we look at that top left picture, tall end pylons all custom uh, lights at the overlooks on that lower left picture. And there's gonna be an all metal railing. It's gonna be a single pier bridge instead of two, uh, which will change the flow of the river a little bit, but uh, we've got that accounted for too. And then also we're gonna perpetuate the path under the south end. So once that project is complete, we're gonna dive into the Sierra Street Bridge replacement. Uh, this one was built in 1937. The total cost is uh, almost $34 million, and uh, we're still moving forward with that one, and hopefully we can jump on that as soon as we get those all bridges done. And then finally, the, the other third one, this is the heaviest lift. This is the Keystone Avenue bridge replacement. This one was built in 1966. We get a lot of concern from the public because they see what it looks like. Uh, this is also structurally deficient, but when you look at the uh, problems, that's really uh, aesthetic. It's it's more like uh, the siding on your house starting to fall apart, but the bones are still good. That's kind of the way the Keystone Bridge is. So we're looking at uh, different methods to replace this bridge. We're looking at whether we want to put pedestrians and bicycles up there, how many lanes of traffic we want on the bridge, or we could also look at sending pedestrians down to Booth Street or pre a pedestrian bridge to get them across and, and then keeping them off the Keystone Bridge altogether. We've also looked at uh, just the geometry of the entire, from the bridge up to California, because they are tricky intersections. Uh, so we're going through that process right now. Yeah, I like to say that I think it's great you're looking at it from all the way from California, all the way down to where it comes off the decline on this side, like we're literally right over here, mm -hmm. this positive thing. Yep. And, and then, yeah. All right, so speaking of bridges, uh, in 2025, we've got four bridges that we'll be resurfacing. I think Ralston Street is the only one in Ward 1, if I'm uh, correct. Uh, we also have Coonsley Street, Evans Avenue, and Valley Road that we'll be resurfacing. By the way, we did just resurface Keystone Bridge this uh, last year, and uh, we did have people wondering why we we're doing that, if we're going to replace it. This is kind of to get us through until we do have construction on that bridge. <laughs> Uh, some upcoming street and highway projects we have in Ward 1. Uh, this one is the West Ward Street Safety Project, and that goes from Keystone Avenue and McCarran Boulevard. It includes two roundabouts, one at Stouffer Avenue and one at Summit Ridge Drive. We're going to reduce the lanes. If we're going to put in a multi-use path, rehab the pavement, and start construction uh, in early uh, 25. This is a $26.5 million project. We have another one on West 4th Street, and this is downtown. This is a lot smaller project. This one goes from Keystone Avenue to Evans Avenue. It'll include some transit stations, pedestrian and ADA improvements. Uh, we'll look at the uh, intersection of Washington Street. We'll have lighting improvements, and uh, construction is right now slated for April of 2025, $6.5 million project. 
Another big one we've got uh, right on the border of Ward 1 is the Virginia BRT improvements. So if you look at that top left picture, that's a mini BRT station. We're going to remove that and replace it with the other two photos with a full-size BRT bus station. So it will be a lot better for the passengers, uh, give them a lot better uh, cover, and it'll have those electronic boards in them too. Uh, another thing we're doing is that bottom left picture, you can see how that ramp from the bus doesn't line up with the platform of that station. That's because our original platforms we built were for larger buses. We really decided that that was a little too much bus, so we went back to our standard buses. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, uh, take a few inches off of those platforms so that that ramp will be flush with the platform. And that makes it a lot easier for people with disabilities to board the buses. Then on the on the right side, we're also planning on extending a bus only lane from Peckham Lane up to Plum Lane. So that'll uh, allow the BRT system to work that much more efficiently. So upcoming street and projects uh, in 2026, the downtown Reno micro mobility project. So we've identified four streets in the downtown area that we're going to really focus on improving biking and walkability in those areas. So the north south south routes, Vine Street, Virginia Street, Lake Street, and Evans Street. Those ones we're really trying to offer a safer connection between the south, the old southwest neighborhood and Midtown so they can get to the north of Interstate 80 safely. Uh, particularly up near the university. So um, this will also create safer and healthier transportation options for people. And that concludes my presentation. I'll take some questions, but first, if we want to go to the next slide, we do have, I mentioned we're in the process of doing our RTP right now. We want to get as much community involvement as we can. So if you guys have a minute, you can scan that QR code, fill out a real quick survey. It only takes about two or three minutes. It's about six uh, multi multi uh, choice questions, or you can go to the website that we have listed there. Uh, any help is uh, is a good thing for us as we move forward with this process. Thank you, Paul. I really appreciate it. Does Margo, does she have any questions before we move? Margo, do you have any questions for Paul? Margo, you're muted. We can't hear you. I think you might have muted. It. Should be able to unmute. Do you see a button asking you to unmute? Um, this is not really Ward One, but I'm just interested in: do we does does the regional transportation plan have any plans in the future for I'm saying North Reno? Meaning if you're trying to get in from any of the valleys, there's only a couple of roads and they're redoing one now. Is there any, I mean, it's a nightmare to get through that area. I'm sorry, but it is. Um, is there any plans to, to make that bigger or wider or get more roads? Yes. Yeah, so right now, as you mentioned, NDOT is in phase one of the widening project. And they're also going to, once that's done, they'll start on phase two. We did get an $89 million infra grant uh, in partnership with NDOT to do that. And that's gonna extend, I think, from Golden Valley up to Stead. They're also, as part of that, going to make some improvements on South or on North Virginia Street between Panther and McCarran. And that'll include some um, multimodal things like uh, multi-use path, some, some better bus stops and things like that. So, Right now, I know there's a lot of growing pains in that area. There's a lot of construction happening and that's gonna happen for quite some time, but hopefully once it's all said and done, we're gonna have a lot better commute for those people in the North Valleys. And there was will, one, will you uh, have buses that will be able to go to North Valleys to bring people into say Midtown, Virginia Street and Plum Lane on down to you know the, the summit? Yeah, so Route 7 serves the North Valleys, and we will continue bus service up in that area. And as I mentioned, we also have a flex ride in the North Valley. Great. I think that adds something to add to. Yeah, we have one other project in the works as well. Um, it's uh, widening uh, North Virginia Street from Panther um, all the way to Stead. So on Old Virginia Street, that parallels 395. So that will be. Um, coming in the future as well, where we will be widening from one lane in each direction to two lanes in each direction. Great, because it's really crowded when you try to go out there. 
And that North Virginia Street project too, we're gonna to do that after the 395 widening is done because we don't wanna clog up North Virginia Street and 395 at the same time. I can understand. Thank you. <laughs> I had a question about the um, uh, West Forest Street roundabout. Since it's been put in there, have, do you have evidence that it slowed speeds, decreased crashes, anything? Do, has that been analyzed yet, whether it accomplished those goals? I'm not aware of any updated safety data yet. So that's actually in DOT's um, right-of-way. And so they um, they monitor and report on all, um, all their crashes and safety data. And I know they, um, they don't update, they update their... Uh, <clears throat> Their website that's available to, to anyone to view um, to see what crash rates have been. If the that has been updated yet, they usually do that on a yearly or a biannually basis. Yeah. Carl, I can tell you at least anecdotally because I do drive through that. Yeah. If I'm lucky, only once a day, uh, mm -hmm. usually several. Um, the biggest impact that I see is a reduction in speed. Uh, through there for people who are coming off of Mesa Rim or Mesa Ridge and turning onto Fourth, mm -hmm. and people just coming through if you're trying to get out of the neighborhoods over there or the park down there um, next to the river. So, it at a very minimum, it has slowed people down and made getting on and off of Fourth Street at least uh, non scientifically in what I see better. So and one of the things I forgot to mention about that project too is that from Mesa Park, you can't turn left anymore. So you have to turn right, go through the roundabout and come back. So it takes away that up that the, the likelihood of getting T-boned as you're trying to get out into yeah, that conflict is gone okay. or greatly reduced. Yeah. Any other board comments? I have a question. The Arlington Bridge, uh, why did we decide to put a pillar in the middle versus it wide open? I always thought debris during the flooding was a big problem, getting caught in the center under the bridges. I can answer that. Um, so when we're when we're talking about um, uh, span length of a bridge, um, the depth of that structure is also impacted. And so you would you would think um, that if you had one clear span or one single span without a pier in the middle, that you would be able to get more flow under the bridge. However, when you increase that span length, your um, the depth of your superstructure or of your the top part of your bridge um, increases um, as well, and so you're actually getting less hydraulic flow underneath um, the structure. So all of that was modeled hydraulically, and you just cannot fit uh, the flow that's necessary. Um, for the different uh, flow scenarios. So like the 100 year flow, the 14,000 CFS flow um, is one of the models we have to run for the US Army Corps of Engineers for a permit. And it just will not fit underneath the structure. And what uh, makes it a little more complicated, right, is we're tying into um, First Street there on the North Bridge and Island on the South Side. Um, you can't raise the elevation of that bridge without um, raising the elevation of either the park or the roadway next to it. When you raise the roadway next to it, then it has a ripple effect in impacting properties and it kind of, it's, it's a domino effect. Um, as far as the park, you can't raise the elevation there because it's already um, in the floodplain. And so you can't add, you can't bring the fill into, um, into that 14,000 CFS inundation limits. And so, that's why we had to um, put a pier in the river. So hopefully that's enough explanation. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> it was looked at the same thing we looked at for Sierra Street, um, but it would have significant impacts to adjacent properties. We don't want to. We don't want to impact the body over the eddy or the right. house on that one. So we. I have no idea. That would be interesting. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Any other board comments? So uh, I'd like to say yay on hydrogen buses. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for building the facility. I hope uh, in long range plans, we make that available to the regular civilians as well for their hydrogen cars at some point. Yeah, one thing that I didn't mention about the hydrogen buses is we're limited with our electric buses. We get about 100 miles of range with them mm -hmm. and then we have to charge them overnight. With the hydrogen buses, 
There are also battery electric buses, but the hydrogen is what charges them. So we'll get about 300 miles of range instead of 100. And it takes about 10 minutes to fill them with hydrogen instead of having to charge them for several hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's it's really an amazing fuel. So and the emissions are nothing but water vapor. So yeah. it's it's really a great technology. Uh thank you for letting me know about the the zone thing, the for lack of a better term, the flex right area. I didn't know that existed. So I think that's really great. I think that's a good program. Thank you for bringing it forward. All right. Are there any questions, comments from the public? One thing I did want to mention is six of those eight projects that Paul presented on are all federally funded. And so um, Arlington has already gone through the NEPA process or the environmental um, clearance process. But many of the, all the other federal projects will also undergo the same environmental process. And so the community will have um, opportunity to input as, as those projects progress. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anyone on Zoom who'd like to get public comment on this item? If you'd like to get public comment by Zoom, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Sure, sure, we have no public comment on this item. All right. Last chance, anybody in the room? Paul, thank you very much for coming and letting us know and spending time with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. No problem. All right. What a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Take this into uh, B2, the City of Reno Language Access Plan. That'll be me. Yeah. Can you just a second? Let me close this blind. Yeah. Oh. Just thinking, no? Yeah, I did. Okay. Thunder for a second or minute. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. So I look at sorry. So I am Noemi Gomez Martinez for the record. Georgia City Manager's Office, and I'm here to provide an update on the language access plan. Um, so the next slide, and really, what is it? Why are we bringing it forth in ways that community can be engaged? Um, so last year, during the legislative session, Assembly Bill 266 was passed, which mandates cities to have a language access plan um, to be able to provide services to our constituents that speak a different language, um, to for equity. And so essentially what it is, it's a formalized document that identifies different components, which I'll speak on the next slide. Um, and part of this also requires, um, and it's also important to us to provide that community outreach, which is why I'm here today. So the language access plan framework, which is identified in the bill, in addition to we've also have identified important frameworks and components that the language access plan will have, one being the language needs assessment. So we are right now doing research on the languages spoken here in the city of Reno and what are the current needs from our constituents that we're, we're hearing. In addition to that, we have also already invested on a few programs and initiatives when it comes to existing language access services, which the plan will also highlight what we have and how they can be accessed by the public and also our language access procedures. So for example, if we have a constituent coming to our city clerk's office um, and they're hard of hearing, how do we provide service to them to be able to get the resources that they need? And so we have procedures in place uh, for our staff to, and for our constituents to access. Uh, so for example, we have are we just invested on Ubi Duo 3 devices? And so those of you that may not know what those are, uh, they're devices known universal that you're able to access wireless without any Wi-Fi and be able to have an interaction face-to-face -face, um, and still getting access to services. Um, so, and then for example, also we've had people come in that speak different languages 
for public comment. So here today, if someone came and spoke Arabic, how we would be the procedurals to get people for their voices to be heard um, in a different language. So we, we are working on language access process. And with that in mind, we also have a training. So it's important that we also train our staff to be equipped with the services that we have in place that we're already invested in looking into further invest investing as well. This specific mandate, uh, it also requires us to look into funding, how much funding allocations needs to be allocated to a language access plan to be able to execute properly, efficiently, and correctly. Uh, so we're also working with various departments across the city to identify those dollars. And final recommendations for City of Reno, this language access plan, uh, we are required to submit to the governor, governor's office of New Americans by August 1st of every even year. So the first submission will be August 1st of this year. Uh, we'll be taken to council for adoption once it's completed. So our team is currently in the process of writing it um, and also uh, looking for feedback from community partners and members. Uh, so currently, right now, we do have a City of Reno language access community survey. There is no deadline to the survey, and the reason why is because we are required through the Assembly Bill to submit every two years, as mentioned. So it's important to us that we continue looking at feedback throughout as we're updating. This survey is available in the top four languages that were identified from the census. So we have English, Spanish, the Filipino language, and Mandarin. Uh, and it's currently available on our website, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, so in conjunction, one of the things that we're doing with Washoe County is they also have a language access plan. Sparks will also have a language access plan, but we are doing a joint listening session. So we are bringing forth an actual draft document that was drafted of the language access plan. Everybody here today is invited to attend. It's scheduled for May 22nd from 5.30 to 7 at the Sierra View Library at the Reno Town Mall. Um, this is an opportunity to see the plan, provide any feedback, get any questions answered uh, before it's taken for adoption. And we will also be able to post it online for those that are not able to attend to see a draft version. Um, so here is the link that it, this QR code takes you to a language access. We have a dedicated page um, on our website. And so you're able to get all the updates uh, that screenshot is, I do need to update that screenshot because we do have the other two surveys, to, the other two languages to take the surveys. We have community meetings up there. If you want to see the draft language of the Assembly Bill 266, which can be found there, terms, definitions, um, all of the above. And then as we it gets through, we'll be doing updates regularly with our resources that we offer at the city of Reno. Okay. And that is in a lump sum kind of where we are. The plan itself, it's quite hefty. It has, we're over, I would say we're probably looking at around 10 to 15 pages of just information of language access, but really our goal is to be able to provide that service and equitability when it comes to accessing our services. Um, other than that, I will take any questions and that's all I have for you today. Questions from the board? Uh, Marga, does she have any? I don't. Okay. Um, my question has to do, is there a separate program for first responders, um, 911 dispatch and that kind of thing? Or is that part of the language access plan? That's a great question. So our, for example, like our first responders, they do have, um, I, I, they're not consultants or partner that they use when accessing language. So part of our plan is we are reaching out to departments and saying, what are you using? What services do you have in place? And we're combining it, but every department does have their own budget when it comes to language access. Uh, we're providing those recommendations and we're putting it all together and letting members know like what happens. So in, in the case for, uh, for fire or for police, they do have their own vendors that they reach out to. We have language universal language services, for example, they offer over 200 languages and they can, mm -hmm. it's a quick call. So they do a stop, then they can do a phone translation. Okay. So they're all a little bit different. 
And so we're yeah. still in the process of getting all that data and information. Okay. Yeah, uh, but part of this program is looking at what they're doing, seeing what works, and because mm -hmm. they're already doing some of this work at least. Yes, and one of our recommendations, because currently we do not have a language access policy, yeah. and so we're looking into putting one in for the okay. city for, for uh, those reasons. Very good. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there any public comment or questions in the room or Zoom room? If anyone on Zoom would like to give public comment on this item, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. May I make a comment? I'm not on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. I've been in the medical field for many, many years, and we use this service where we have many different languages. And um, you can just call that number and be able to, you know, just tap right into the direct communication, which is so effective. And, you know, not to reinvent the wheel, but it, it that resource was pretty amazing. I don't have one name of it, but yeah. That sounds like it's similar to something that they're already, you're already looking at or to the police are already using something similar in it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's great. Something that not to read that we have. But I'll look at, yeah, we're looking into different services and I know like Community Corps, they're also using, they use specific services as well. Um, so we are tapping into those. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Is there anyone else in the room who'd like to provide comment on this item? Seeing none, if there's no public comment on this item, Mr. Clark. All right. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And that moves us into development. So we'll start with C1 and 60 Ambassador Cannabis Dispensary. We have a presentation or a presenter. Yes, he's on Zoom. Judah, can you hear us? It looks like you're muted. Are you able to unmute? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Let me Beautiful. know when you're ready for me to share your uh, graphics for sure. the presentation. I'll let you know. Are we good? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, whenever, whenever you're ready. So what you guys were looking at, but you're looking at me, so great. Um, so let me just take a second to thank the board members, staff, and the public here in attendance. My name is Judah Zakalik. I'm a local Nevada attorney for 20 years, but also chairperson of Congerium 2 LLC. And Congerium 2 is a owner of a conditional cannabis dispensary license for Reno. Um, Congerium, to give you a little bit of background on the company, is made up of six Nevada licensees in cannabis. And right now, these licensees operate distribution companies, cultivation companies, production companies, and dispensaries. Um, this group was owns rather uh, five different licenses throughout Nevada. We are in the process of opening a congerium dispensary in Tonopah right now that should be open in about a month. And I'll come back to that in a moment to talk about that. But one of our licenses is for Reno. So we like... Um, well, let me go on a little bit more about Congerium just so you have an idea. The The members of Congerium are made up of lawyers, pharmacists, uh, healthcare professionals, real estate developers, and nonprofit leaders. It is uh, majority minority owned, which is, means it's either owned majority by uh, females or uh, people of racial minority. So that is a... Uh, a rare thing to find in the cannabis industry and in Nevada as well. So we're very proud of that. Uh, what we've noticed as uh, dispensary owners and licensees is that there's several areas in Nevada that, that are just underserved and do not uh, allow the, the local population to have access to cannabis, whether it's medicinal or recreational. Uh, we've noticed that in Las Vegas, where this group, one of the group members owns a dispensary, which has done well servicing the outlying communities. Um, this is one of the reasons why we're opening up in Tonopah as well, because rural Nevada does not have access to this medicine. Some of those people are driving two and a half hours one way to uh, get access to cannabis. And it's the same thing we've kind of noticed in Reno too. There, the fair amount of the dispensaries are kind of um, centered around uh, the 580 corridor and not much on the outlying areas. So we like this area, the 960 uh, Ambassador Drive, because it, we believe it will serve 
um, underserved uh, communities. It's uh, along the, if you're not familiar, which I'm sure you probably are familiar, but it's along uh, the cross section of Rob Drive and the I-80. Uh, if, if you wanna share some of those pictures, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy for you to share those. You kind of have an, an idea of the outside of the building. It was a, it was a former Kelly Moore paint building if you guys are familiar with that um but you don't have to show the video as of yet although you guys can look at it later um there's a video that my that we took of the outlying building but that's that's where the public would access that's another side of the building and then i also took a picture of google maps so you have an idea the red uh drop is where the building is thank you for that uh, you know, some of the things that we need to be concerned about as cannabis licensees are, of course, the state and local regulations as far as distance requirements. So that's 1,500 feet as the crow flies for non-restricted uh, gaming. So we do have that separation. Uh, at least I don't see any non-restricted gaming around there. Uh, 1,500 or excuse me, 1,000 feet from schools. Uh, we are at least 2,000 feet from any schools. And then at least 300 feet from any community uh, organization slash church. And we're at least 2,000 feet away from any church there. Also, we're not adjacent to any neighborhood uh, zoned areas, which is one of a Reno specific uh, regulation. Uh, let's see here. Um, I will say to you, I've been looking for uh, locations in Reno for the past two years, and it is not easy to meet these distance requirements and um, and zoning requirements, uh, and especially in a in a kind of outlying area. So we really like this area for this purpose. We think it could serve well. I will also say, just surrounding this location, so you guys have a better idea of what's around there. We have Rob Drive to the east. We have an empty lot owned by a local builder and Hampton Suites uh, to the south. The Hampton Suites is a little bit uh, past the local, the uh, the empty lot. Starbucks and a United Federal Credit Union building to the north. And then Ambassador Drive and an empty lot owned by Maverick, or and then an empty lot and then Maverick gas station to the west. So that's kind of the surrounding area. I'm happy to answer questions about our group, our makeup, the location as much as I can about the cannabis industry as a whole. But this, just to reiterate, is for a cannabis dispensary that will be open to the public. Uh, as of uh, the last legislative session, there is no longer a distinction between recreational and medicinal. So we can sell both uh, kinds of cannabis at this location. Thank you. I'm open to comments, questions, um, any issues. Us. Okay. Any questions from the board? Uh, do you have, uh, what would the uh, operating hours be? So we don't have yet uh, any set operating hours. Um, I would say to you, ideally, I'd like to do something like, you know, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, but if that is outside of you know, what the neighborhood and, and the city would like, then we're open. But we want to make sure that people have access to this when they need it. You know, um, I'm assuming that Reno is somewhat of a 24-hour town, you know, given gaming up there and, and everything else. So uh, as much as we can provide access to the community for this, we'd like to. But, you know, we're definitely open to, uh, to comment and thoughts. Okay. All right. And... This question is more for the city personnel representatives, if we have any in the room or on Zoom. Um, there is a request here for a change and whatnot. So my question is, uh, everything around there, people pretty much rent or lease. Uh, were any of those people who rent or lease the neighboring businesses or properties, were they notified? Is there anybody from the city that can answer that? Mr. Chair, we have Leah Picotti, please go. Okay. Hello, um, I'm Leah Picotti. I'm a planner with the city of Reno. And I apologize, I heard you say you had a question, but then I got yeah. converted to a panelist, so I got cut off. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for being here, Leah. My question was, um, were any of the neighboring folks who rent or lease notified of the uh, LDC here? 
Uh, notification isn't required in this because this is not actually a land development case. It's a little bit of um, it's a little bit of an oddball because the reason that the applicant is here presenting to you today is that it's located in the Charlins planning planned unit development, and the way that this was written basically says that any uses that would be allowed in NC, GC, regular commercial zoning districts that's not specified in the Charlins handbook has to go before the Ward 5 advise Neighborhood Advisory Board to get a recommendation um, for any kind of whether or not it should be approved by the administrator is essentially what it is. So what you guys are doing here is you're listening to what the applicant is telling you, and then you're going to make a recommendation um, through your public input directed to the administrator as to whether or not this should be approved. And I'll note for members of the board, it, it won't be a vote. It's your individual recommendations registered for public comment. This item is noticed for discussion only. So if you have comments in favor or against, please voice them. Yeah. Correct. And yeah. just, just to be totally clear, this type of use would generally be located in the in a GC zone or a mixed use zone. Um so my, my question really is more of a process within the city, and I understand there's the put overlay, uh, but so were property owners given the little yellow postcards or blue postcards? No. That didn't go out at all? No, because we are not, it, it doesn't require public notice. It's okay. not, it's not a land development case. It's not, it's mm -hmm. just something that may or may not be deemed appropriate by the administrator based on the comments provided by the neighborhood advisory board and several other factors. Okay, uh, for my two cents, my public comment is because the neighbors don't know anything about it. Uh, I think it's inappropriate. It's not having to do with the business itself, but there was a unrestricted gaming type of company going there, which we've looked at before. Um, the neighbors should know about those. And I said the same thing about that. That's my two cents. Um, but I don't know if other people on the board feel the same way. I, I have no comment on Wager Daily. For yeah. this item, can you please state your names? Uh, members? Jerry Wager. And the first comment was Chair Shrimp. Hello, Morning House for the record. Yeah, I see no reason why this shouldn't be treated like any other business. It's a commercial zone and cannabis is legal. Um, I don't think it's any different than putting in any kind of store. So I have no issues with putting it there. We'll take public comments after the board comments. I um, see. Go ahead, I, Marla. Um, I, I agree that there should be some kind of notice going out to the people in there, even if it's not required. Somebody should make make it known what they're trying to do. I mean, I don't care if it's there or not there personally, but I think people who live in the area should have an opportunity to find out what is going on. Jim, do you have any comments? Yeah, uh, it's kind of a difficult one because it's, uh, if, if, the, if the law or the, if the regulations are written doesn't require notification, and that's a business, it's perfectly legal, then I think you have a right to, to go in there. Yeah. No, I generally agree with that. It's just the people know. Are there any other board member comments? But I just have a question um, for the planning person. When you say the administrator, who, who is that in this case that, that is takes these comments? Who is the administrator? That's a good question. Thank you. The director of development services. Chris Pingree. Chris Pingree, yes. Or, or I mean, Angela Foose could also act as administrator in something like this as well. I believe we do have a couple of public products here. So if you want to start first, please start by stating your name for the record and you'll have three minutes to so make sure you speak up so our people on Zoom can hear you. My name is Jessica Glover. I'm running for Reno City Council Ward 1. And I oppose any more uh, businesses that are selling marijuana. I've been um, 
I've been assaulted recently by someone who was high on cannabis. And I believe that cannabis, as a previous user, it affects your clarity. You cannot think straight when you are high, whether you're using it for medical or personal. I do not want to see any more cannabis dispensaries in my community. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Jessica. If you could please fill out a public comment form at the front of the room. Sandra, did you have a comment? No, uh, Sally. Sally, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just need clarification. I'd like to talk to you earlier about the geographic uh, boundaries of the word one. I'm so confused. Is this really point one? This location? Seems to be right. That's my question. Yeah. I just need clarification on this. I believe this is Ward 5, but I think that they have to go before the board. Let me double check. Because I believe they're scheduled for two uh, different um, uh, neighborhood advisory board meetings. Is that correct? That That so, is correct. I'll be yeah. presenting five tomorrow. Yeah. So this is actually Ward 5. I think the handbook identifies Ward 1 because the handbook was written when this was in Ward 1 and it's now in Ward 5. So they're going to Ward 1 to satisfy the requirements of the handbook, which specifically says Ward 1. But they're also going to go to Ward 5, which is you know the neighborhood where this project's actually located. Um, but that's my understanding. Tyler Sharp Community is on for the record. Uh, is there anyone on Zoom who'd like to give public comment on this item? If you'd like to give public comment by Zoom, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Mr. Chair, we have no further public comment on this item. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Judah. Appreciate your time being here. And good luck going forward. Appreciate it. I think for your time as well. And, and thank you for your thoughts and input. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I not see that? Yeah. Yeah. Max. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That moves us into C2. Uh, River Point at Idlewilds. Uh, good evening. Chris Baker, Manhart Consulting, here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, nice to see that you guys are, are back in business. Uh, we're getting informed again. It's good to see. I think these are obviously important tools in the city. Um, so what we have in front of you tonight uh, is River Point at Idlewild. Um, there's an aerial here. You can see the, the project boundary in red. Uh, it's an infill project off of Idlewild Drive. Go ahead, Tyler, switch. The project location, 2865 Idlewild Drive. You see it south of the river there. Um, and to give you a little bit more context, uh, Idlewild Park there on the east, and then Swope Middle School is kind of directly southwest. Sure. Thanks. Existing designations, uh, MAPS plan designations, multiple family. The existing zoning is MF30, so 30 dwelling units per acre. Uh, we're not posing, proposing any modifications to these designations. Do you get a density bonus? Uh, no. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, in 22, uh, LBC 39 was approved. That actually was approved for 120 residential condominiums. Uh, these structures were three stories. Um, there was a tentative map that was approved and a CUP as part of that uh, application. That uh, project is currently in place and um, the approval is a four year process. So there's two more years active on that map. So what we're proposing today uh, is actually to remove and replace that request. Uh, the same two applications, it's a tentative subdivision map, just like what was approved, uh, but instead of for 120 units, this is for 57 units. Mm -hmm. And then also a conditional use permit. Uh, the trigger here is uh, more than 20 units and less than 100 units in an in in MF30 zone. Go ahead. Well, here's our current request site plan. Uh, I don't know if any of you are here in, in 2022, uh, the configuration is very similar. Uh, you can see Idlewild Drive there on the south. Um, you have ingress, egress there. There's an interior loop road, uh, a lot of open space adjacent to Idlewild Drive. Uh, these are two-story units. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, previously there were three story units. Uh, and the difference here is these are more of a row house or, um, uh, you know, you end up with, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, um, kind of a townhouse uh, structure uh, where you end up selling the footprint and the surrounding um, real estate. So rear yards, front yards, and then everything else is common area. Um, as you can see, there's kind of a connected trail system, uh, detention, lift station, uh, and the other requirements. What you have in the, in the table there is kind of a compare and contrast uh, the code requirement, that's the underlying zoning designation of MF30 uh, standards. The current approval, again, the project site's uh, a little over five and a half acres. Uh, currently approved is 120 units. Again, we're proposing 57. Uh, we are reducing the building height by a story, so uh, consequently you end up going from a little over 44 feet to a little over 26. Uh, again, the underlying zoning designation is 30 dwelling units per acre. Uh, we are proposing uh, 10.2, whereas currently approved is uh, a little over 21, and consequently you end up with additional open space. Uh, here's some conceptual elevations. Again, these are a single family attached project, uh, so they, they're they configured in triplexes and sevenplexes, so you do get that row house feel. Uh, these houses will have uh, two car garages, they're two and three bedroom units. Uh, ranging in size from 1,700 to about 1,900 square feet. Um, parking is always uh, a big topic in infill. Uh, there's actually 114 stalls required. We're providing 246. So not only do you get the garages, you actually get a driveway. Uh, so you have four parking stalls per unit plus 18 common area stalls for guest parking. Again, there's uh, seven flex conceptual elevations. Um, and since we we also processed the application in, in 22, uh, at that time we had lots of um, outreach. Uh, it's it's an infill site. There's adjacent property owners that have uh, long established roots there. Uh, we've been in front of the, the HOA board previously, and we've actually already uh, met with them um, ahead of this meeting. Uh, we had a Zoom meeting with, uh, with the board last uh, week. Um, so when we've addressed their comments, and um, you know we're also going to walk the site. Uh, with them to, you know, as we move through design, uh, if there's any things that they see, mostly from a drainage standpoint, uh, you know, when you do have a um, developed environment around an infill site, you know, they pick up things that maybe mapping can't. So we want to make sure and, and listen to them and, and see anything that they have that, that we want to make sure to address. So we're definitely in, in constant communication with those surrounding neighbors. <clears throat> with that, I'm available for any questions. Any further questions? My, I think, well, I'm, I'm curious as to why the change. I'm thrilled that you feel that. You're seeing like people want to build like these monstrous things that are, you know, just incredible. Just so this is a much more modest development, smaller, you know, lower. I, bravo. I, I, I'm thrilled. But uh, I was a little curious as was it a market force sort of thing to change the design? Or? Well, um, so the, the previous development really falls more under, although it is a, a condo development, it really fell more under the multifamily, especially from a financing standpoint. And I don't know if you've noticed interest rates that kind of went up in the last few years. Uh, and then not to mention target audience. So um, this is a toll revenue project, um, mm -hmm. a very uh, reputable uh, builder. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the mm -hmm. stuff, not just locally, but nationally. Uh, and they, they just built different stuff. Um, so their target audience, and this is is more first time home buyers, downsizers. Um, it's really just a, it's a different end user, um, and because of that, you end up with half as many units. Yeah. So they're going to be able to offload each individual parcel. Yeah, we're uh, the, they're they're Okay. Yes. All right. Um, I'm going to echo the yay. We went smaller <laughs> and shorter, and I'm very happy about that. Um, we'll. Trash pickup be at the end of everybody's driveway? Yeah, standard residential trash pickup in the garages uh, are sized appropriately for uh, receptacle storage. What kind of feedback did you get from the neighbors and the HOAs and stuff like they that? Love it. Yeah. Very well, similar to this. And honestly, they love the other one too. Yeah. Um, if, if you're yeah. familiar with the property, there's been a lot of stuff proposed and actually constructed there. So there's utilities there's and things on the ground that need to be there. pulled up. Uh, there was uh, some medical use there at one point. Uh, there's been kind of things, you know, over over the last 30 plus years, um, and a lot of things have just not 
actually come to fruition. So people were happy, uh, even with the current project that's approved, just because it was a conclusion. Um, obviously now kind of pivoting from something that's 45 foot tall to something that's 25 plus foot tall, um, they're, they're happy. So what floor plan is that? I mean, uh, that's shaded apps. It's added. Okay. Bit, that sounds good. All right. Margo. I think it's great that they've done changed the density on it and the height. Is there anyone in the room who'd like to give public comment on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone on Zoom who'd like to give public comment on this? No, we don't want in the room. Um. What would be, I just have a couple questions. What would be um, the purchase? What would be like the purchase amount? Uh, I mean, we just decided we don't go low. So, um, and, and I think that's kind of depends on when they come to my table. So, the way these go is, you know, we're at the very early stage. So, this is uh, the entitlement process. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is a 30% design uh, approved uh, planning commission. This actually goes to planning commission in June. Uh, and there, then what ends up happening is the math is actually good for four years. They go forward and forward the that. And then obviously there's there's a site permit plan, trading permit, so uh, permit and other things. I would envision these generally uh, would be going from like a to two years. Um, so obviously whatever the market ends up being, it could change drastically. So I don't, I don't, I don't guess, sorry. So as a builder, um, and our homeless population, would you be more, you know, opposed to building and it's more affordable um, for people that are low monthly income, such as um, Social Security, that they might make maybe a thousand a month and they need people that are going to be able to get to the queue, like can afford to live in those type of properties, which forces them to live um, in shelters and like that. So, would you be opposed to building? So I, I'm not a builder. I work for an engineering firm. We do ground down. So sewer always costs the same. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't disagree with you. There's definitely a need for for uh, for some uh, different price points in house for sure. As a term of nineteen eighty six, and we just have to know more expensive, more expensive, more expensive housing that means that people are you know, actually more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Even though. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anyone else in the room who'd like to give public comment on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone on Zoom who'd like to give public comment on this item? If you'd like to give public comment by Zoom, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Mr. Chair, we have no public comment on this item. Okay. Uh, just a clarifying point on, and I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Um, but the the general idea is best information available is this is going to be a market level retail housing. There's no affordable housing part of this yeah. particular project or anything. Like no, that. yeah. Again, there is yeah, I that's you alluded to it initially. You know, there's no density bonuses here. Yeah. Um, this is not subsidized by any means. This is going to be market rate housing. All right. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks. And that's a C three. That is me. Larue and Martin Street abandonments. Oh no! Oh no! Oh, no. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> she has a mobile home. Thank you for keeping yeah. me honest. I it's appreciate okay. that. Was this the laser thing? Yep. That. Oh, it does actually. But okay. Mm, okay. So the people. Oh. I'll follow it with <laughs> All right. So uh, my name is Aubrey Powell. For the record, I'm an associate attorney at Luis Roca, and I am here today on behalf of the applicant for this zoning map amendment and master plan amendment application. Just to preview a little bit, we also concurrently filed boundary line adjustments with this application that was uh, filed separately by our surveyor, and those have already been approved. So there have been some changes in the boundary lines here. So I'll try to point those out to you when it's when it's relevant. So just to give you a general idea of where we're at, we're just up the street from where we are now. So this property here it doesn't show very well on the screen. Yep, yeah, there we go. That's the Elm Estate. That is the applicant. They do own the Elm Estate. They own the mobile home park right next uh, door, and then they own the parcels to the north as well along Chisholm Street. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, so they own 
I think one, two, three, Chisholm Street is also a parcel in of itself. It used to be a public roadway. It's no longer, that portion is no longer a public roadway. They own that vacant parcel, funky shaped there, and then the next one to the to the west. Next slide. So we we have in this one application, we have four different zoning map amendment requests that we're asking for. So I've tried to break it down one by one. Um, and then we just have one master plan amendment that we are here for. So the first zoning map amendment is this funky northern parcel. It's split zoned, um, which we never really want to have because it complicates things um, because each zoning designation has its own uh, development standards. So to accommodate, well, one is general commercial, which is the red, and then the gray is uh, zoned industrial. So we did file a uh, boundary line adjustment for this parcel and said essentially it's going to become two parcels separate. The industrial, that line is going to move east, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Industrial is going to maintain its zoning, but then we've got to deal with this general commercial piece on the end. Um, so this, the, this parcel has a master plan land use designation of mixed employment. And it gets confusing because we also have a zoning designation called mixed employment. Mm -hmm. So we have the master plan land use designation is mixed employment. General commercial does not conform to mixed employment under the master plan. So we're rezoning it to mixed employment under the mixed employment. That word's going to get old very quickly. But uh, so we want to bring it into conformance, one, because it's desirable for um, the applicant, but also uh, something that the city has shown an interest in. So if you want to move to the next slide, I can show you. So the top is where we're at. You've got the general commercial in the red, you've got industrial in the gray. And now if you go to the bottom map, you can see where the boundary line is moving to the east. So that gray parcel is now going to be its own parcel. And then the purple um, is going to be the new mixed employment zoning. So, um, and we'll, I can show you guys a little bit later about what the what the development plans are for those parcels. And we'll move on to the next. Feel free to stop me if at any time. So the next request is again another funky one. We've got Chisholm Street. So this portion of Chisholm Street was abandoned by the city, um, and the applicant then acquired it in March of 2021. Oddly enough, when, when the city abandoned it, it wasn't giving it wasn't given a zoning designation, but it was given a master plan land use designation. So it has no zoning right now. And so that makes it something we can't develop. So we're looking to keep that in conformance with uh, the master plan zone uh, mixed employment and then also have it um, you know be consistent with those northern parcels that we're also looking to make mixed employment. Mm -hmm. And then, and so here you can see it. It's white right now. It's got no zoning designation. It's no longer a public roadway. Um, so we kind of want to steer away from that. So we wanted to um, zone and mix it for that. And that's going to be all purple. And that'll be that'll become kind of like a private driveway for these parcels down the road. Okay. So the third one is this little parcel off to the west here. It's very small. There's nothing we can do with it where it's going to stay the way it is. But again, just looking to bring things into conformance with the master plan. We're already here. We thought we might as well get it rezoned, make some employment so it's in conformance. Um, and again, staying consistent with those other parcels. But no, no plans for it. There's really nothing we could do with that parcel just because of the size and the shape of it. Can I ask? Yeah. What is mixed employment used for? So I actually brought a little excerpt from the master plan. I thought someone might ask me that. Let me see here. Okay, so the, the primary use of mixed employment is light manufacturing, processing, wholesaling, flex space, research and development, and offices. In some locations, it may also include high quality, large employment facilities, such as corporate offices and educational campuses. And there's, there's secondary uses as well, uh, support services, small scale retail, restaurants, indoor and other commercial uses. But when you look at the conforming base zone districts, so when we, when we realized, you know, we've got mixed employment here, um, master plan 
we are then limited to what's in the master plan of what we can rezone. So initially we talked about rezoning to industrial, but when you go to the master plan, industrial is specifically limited to properties that already are zoned industrial. So we can't do industrial, which is why we're keeping that one parcel as industrial because we don't want to lose that because we can never go back. So when we looked at our future plans and we worked with staff and we kind of told them what we wanted to do with these parcels, and we looked at the zoning districts that were available to us, mix and plan was the one that made the most sense. Changing the size of the parcel doesn't trigger a change in zoning? No, that's not what triggers the change in zoning. Well, it, it does in the sense that it, it the zoning, it limits us. You have to have a certain, in order to like rezone to industrial, you have to have the parcels to be a certain size. But in mixed employment, which I also brought here too, there is no um, lot width minimum or maximum as far as standards under the city code. So that's kind of what made it ideal for us is that we weren't going to be locked into a certain lot size. But some zoning districts do have those standards. Uh, I, I guess my question was, uh, basically, you're going to keep the industrial as a grandfathered, for lack of a better term, yeah. um, but changing the part of the size, the shape of it doesn't trigger a change. No, it's still because we, we change, if we go back to that one, if you want to go back, actually go Because that's the one that's changing shape, right? If you see right? it's 1.7 acres, uh, or I'm sorry, after it's rezoned, it's 1.15 acres. And I think, I can't remember off the top of my head what the, what the lot a uh, requirement is, but we ran all that by staff to make sure that it would still be within the standards of the code. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then we thank have... you for explaining. Yeah, of course. So yeah, you can see here we're at red, general commercial, and then upon this zone change, we would be purple um, as the mixed employment zoning. Um, and then the final zoning map amendment request is for this. Uh, 2.83 acre parcel that is zoned MF21, and it's currently used as a mobile home park and that's also owned by the applicant. Um, really, this is just a cleanup item. So we discovered that this yellow parcel, the mobile home parcel, has some encroachment structures onto its neighboring parcel, the Elm Estate parcel. So just as a cleanup matter, we needed to readjust that boundary line. And then when you adjust the boundary line, you've got to get the zoning to match with the parcel that's absorbing it. So um, nothing's changing here. It's purely getting those encroachments off of um, the Elm Estate parcel just as a cleanup. It, you, you never really want encroachments on a property if you ever go to sell or um, finance or anything like that. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see where the original boundary line is. If you go down to the bottom, you'll see there. And then we're shifting it over just a bit. And then because that mobile home park is absorbing that small portion, you've got to get it uh, zoned MF21 so it matches with the parcel that's uh, absorbing it. So just a cleanup item there. We thought we were already here, so we might as well. So the residential piece, the existing residential, we're not going to lose any residents. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. Nothing's changing. It's Those are the, the structures that are on that residential uh Parcel are the ones that are actually encroaching onto the Elm Estates. So that parcel is actually getting a little bit but bigger. Actually yeah. preserves but that. nothing's, nothing's okay. changing there now. Thank you. And then going back to the Chisholm Street parcel, because this is why we are doing a master plan amendment as well. Um, I said the city didn't, when they abandoned it, it wasn't given a zoning designation. Um, interestingly, it was, giving, it was given a master plan land use designation, and it was split between the northern parcels, which have a master plan land use designation of mixed employment, and then you've got the southern parcels have the designation of suburban mixed use. So a decision was made that that Chisholm Street parcel would be split between the two. Well, now that we're asking to rezone it, we need to clean that up and have it be one master plan designation. Um, so that's why we are asking for it to be uh, mixed employment, because we are zoning at mixed employment. Um, so really this one's just a cleanup item so we can move forward with the zoning. You can see that here, it's going to become all mixed employment. And then the next slide, I believe, apologize, it's a little blurry. So that, in, that industrial parcel, the plan for that, and this is permitted by right in that zoning, is mini warehouse storage, which is pretty consistent with some of the other uses in the area. There's some other storage out there. Um, so this is just the civil improvement plans. Um, we submitted landscaping plans and everything like that. 
So we have worked with staff to make sure we are staying consistent with everything. Uh, there's this 10 foot, I think it was 10 feet, um, bike path option that when the when our when the applicant bought this property, I guess it was sold to them with this option that at some point maybe the city, I believe it could build this bike path back here. Um, and they have 10 years to do it. We're about three years into that. So all of our plans are based on if that were to ever happen, whether it does or not in 10 years, we don't know, but it could. So we've planned everything around that potential uh, option for a bike path there. So we did setbacks and everything according to that. And then that little off piece parcel that was sharing um, an APN with that industrial space. All that's gonna be is just overflow parking for the Elm Estate. They're a pretty big venue. Um, they don't always need the overflow. They've got pretty substantial parking on their parcel, but every so often they have a big wedding um, or just a particularly big event. And so this is, it's kind of funky the way the parking's laid out, but again, the parcel size is kind of weird. So we had to work with what we had. Um, also recognizing that bike path option is back there as well. So this adds, I believe, 36 mm -hmm. additional spots for the Elma State for overflow parking. And these are just some of the master plan guiding principles and goals, which is something we always look towards when we're submitting an application. Um, one, supporting an existing business. Um, the, the applicant, like I said, owns the Elma State, owns the River West, West Resort. They've put in a lot of money and time um, into kind of redeveloping this little corner of West 2nd Street. Um, and they've built a wonderful business that I, I think brings a lot of business from outside the area as well. Um, the Elm Estate's beautiful, so they've done a lot over there. Um, again, we're, we're using this as a way to revitalize and use some vacant parcels that just aren't being, that are just completely underutilized and finding something to do with them that's still complementary to the area. Um, and then also, it's bringing parcels that are not into conformance with the master plan into conformance with the master plan, which is something the city has stated that they, they are very interested and want to do. So available for questions. Complicated. <laughs> I tried to break it down as simple as, you know, not as, you know, make it not super boring, but <laughs> I know it can be a little boring. Right. <laughs> um. Are there any questions from the board, Marco? I'm I'm just trying to figure out: is this where the elm is, or is the elm farther um, on uh, west? This is exactly where the elm estate is. So the the applicant is the owner of the elm estate. Okay, so they want to use this other area for additional yes. parking. So you, yes. So if you see that northern parcel, so there's the elm estate, and then there's this parcel above them that's in the red grayish area that's going to be some overflow parking of 36 spots um for you know when they do need it they have big weddings there from time to time and the parking they have there isn't always enough i'm now i because i was looking at this trying to figure out where we were on chisholm street and i, I i've got it thank you okay mm -hmm. my question my question has to do with noticing maybe it's more for somebody with the city. Um, we're actually hosting a neighborhood meeting on Thursday of next week at the Elm Estate. So we noticed the, the neighbors have already been noticed by the city, I believe, for the planning commission meeting, which is June 6th. Mm -hmm. Our firm separately noticed all neighbors within seven, or I'm sorry, all property owners and then any tenants of mobile home parks within 750 foot radius were noticed of our neighborhood meeting next week. We're going to put it at the Elm Estate, so it'll be on site. And I'll be there again. Okay. So the folks who live in River West, oh, yeah. who are they, absolutely renting. Yeah. So any rent, yeah. they got a letter from from, from us, actually. From Thank you friend. for doing that. I yeah. really appreciate it. I wish the city would do something like that. Well, so for under NRS, we I think for it's the master plan amendment that triggered it. Leah, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we noticed, I think we sent out 326 notices, and that includes all the tenants of the mobile home parks. There's two on Fourth Street that were in that radius, and then River West, which our applicant, the applicant does own. Yeah. Uh, and so all of those people were noticed. They're all invited to come to the Elm Estate next Thursday, and I'll be there and answer any direct questions from neighbors. Thank you for doing this. And just to follow up on that a little bit, um, so Nevada 
requires that in any master plan amendment that the applicant holds a community meeting and the noticing range for that is the same as the noticing range for the city. So in this particular case, uh, because this is a master plan amendment and a zoning map amendment, all neighbors within 750 feet, including every tenant of the mobile home park, gets a courtesy notice, gets a hearing notice, and gets an invite to the to the community meeting. Okay, so I appreciate that. Something that you said that's new to me is what triggers somebody who is not a property owner to be noticed? What triggers that? So we have a provision in code to make sure that tenants of mobile home parks are notified. And uh, originally we used to keep an updated list that had all of the tenants names, but because we couldn't keep that updated, now it just, we just noticed the space number. So if it's, you know, 1000 First Street and there's a hundred mobile homes parked there, every tenant space one, space two, space three, space four, okay. everybody gets the notice. Okay, so to say it another way, uh, if there was an apartment building where that mobile home park is, the people who live in the apartment building would not have been noticed. Correct. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Is there anyone in the room who'd like to give public comment on this item? Is there anyone on Zoom who'd like to give public comment on this item? If you'd like to give public comment by Zoom, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Mr. Chair, we have no further public comment on this item. Thank you very much. Okay. And my goodness, it's a lot of. <laughs> yeah. This you guys are my first stop. That's a lot of doing. The next few months. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a great night. All right. Let's try again. <laughs> All right. C four of the Rue Avenue and Martin Street Alley abandonment. Try that again. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brooke Oswald. I'm with the REC Group, representing the uh, applicant this evening. Um, this is an abandonment. These are uh, a little bit unique. These will go directly to City Council. So I'll run through uh, this and a little bit of the history of what we could find and then the request. Next slide, please. So the location, um, originally I had, uh, it was animated, but it's coming in as a PDF. So it'll be a little bit trickier to kind of run through this. The yellow line on the right that you see is uh, South Virginia Street with the star representing the roundabout, if that gives you an idea where it is. The yellow marker is the project's, uh, the adjacent property or the property or right by the project. Uh, that's the best bet motel that's currently under uh, construction and being renovated uh, to be a, once again, a nightly motel. If we go to the right there, the star representing the Best Bet Hotel, looking, there's a small yellow uh, triangle on the outside. That is the requested abandonment area. Uh, they are, as I said, they are redeveloping that and doing that. They're looking at uh, this under, used or, or non-used piece of the alleyway there uh, and requesting an abandonment. Next slide. So this is what it looks like from the back of the site on the right there. Um, you can see the triangle of that. Uh, the alleyway makes a job there. The history wasn't really clear. Originally that alley was straight and somewhere in, in the, the history it took a job. And when it took that jog, it created this weird uh, remnant piece that you see in the, the yellow uh, there. Um, looking at the arrow there is the doorway. And this is one of the big reasons why they're requesting this. Uh, this puts a piece of public property right outside their emergency door. So they can't control access there. So someone could park, put dumpsters or whatever at that access point. So that, that's one of the big issues there. Uh, you can see the yellow line approximately where that would be. Additionally, it provides a, a better service for waste management as they can pull directly in um, for the uh, dumpster service. Next slide, please. So this is looking more technically as we look at this. Uh, as I stated, there was that job that was established. The alleyway usually uh, originally went straight through and then at some point it was it was jog. We couldn't find the history of that, but when it made that jog, it created this weird weird sort of uh, leftover piece. 
Um, we've maintained 20 feet, which is the standard that's needed along the alleyway. It's approximately 707 square feet. Um, this was acquired through dedication. What that means is uh, the adjacent property owner originally dedicated that land to the city of Reno to build the alleyway. Per uh, NRS or Nevada revised statute, the applicant does have the opportunity um, or the adjacent property owner to request that land back if it's not being used or uh, it no longer serves a public need. Uh, in this case, we believe that that it, it does no longer serve a need and it does offer um, some additional benefits to that adjacent prop property. Next slide. Our zoning, just to go over this, master uh, plan use is urban mixed use. Uh, that's where we're seeing some of our higher uses. Um, this is an area of Midtown, which we've seen a lot of redevelopment and continued redevelopment. This is supportive of that. Um, and then it's in that mixed use Midtown commercial area down below. We're seeing the, that resilient economy, revitalization, vibrant neighborhood centers, safe, healthy, inclusive communities are the, the sort of big overarching master plan policies that we're looking at. Once again, um, my name is Brooke Oswald. I'm with the Red Land Planning and Design and available for questions. Yeah, yes, the only house for the record. So just to make sure I understand, so you're not asking for abandonment of the alley, just that triangular piece that's between the alley and the business. That's correct. Okay. So that, that odd little jog that's in the roadway there. Okay. Uh, so the rest of the alley will still function as alley. It meets all the requirements per city code of alley width and structure and everything. Okay. Are there any other board comments? For I have a question. On this area, if I understand correctly, you want it for this the hotel motel that's under construction so you can use it for waste management and other deliveries? Yeah, it's uh yes, yeah, so it is adjacent to the it's the Beth Bet Motel. So we are um it would be assumed into that property once if the abandonment is approved through city council. Um, that it serves to provide that proper access out of there and the safety and control of their emergency access out the back. Additionally, uh, waste management is able to pull in, we anticipate their, their waste service, which would be a screen um, dumpster or, or appropriate cans uh, that uh, waste management could pull in directly and pull that out through that area. So, so it's basically being used to help this property get waste management get emergency or whatever correct it really kind of okay. serves it, it's not being really used by the public but it does help to facilitate this redevelopment of this property okay thank you are there questions or comments in the room or online would anyone on zoom like to get public comment on this item if you'd like to get public comment on zoom please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your zoom window Seeing no comments in the room or on Zoom, there's no public comment on the side of Mr. Chair. Right. Very good. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very guys. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right. So it moves into D, Board Commission Committee members, reports, announcements. Any announcements from anybody? No, oh, I'm, I'm not clear on this right now. Um, I think when is our what what day did you say our next meeting was? June tenth. And is um, I have a feeling I'm on the um, well I'm I'm on the city charter committee and for some reason I think they're moving that meeting instead of the first the first Monday to the second Monday and I'm going to check on that and get back to you. Is there a way we can? make ours the first Monday and theirs can stay the second Monday? Because otherwise they're both on the same date at the same time. I'll confirm with the Charter Committee's board liaison and see when it's scheduled for. And if it does end up conflicting, I'll work with Council Member Breckis to decide what she'd like to do with the meeting. Yeah, because I think, I think that Charter Committee is because somebody in the administration had some kind of major conflict. And I think the charter committee said, fine, you know, but I didn't realize it was the same. Thanks for clapping, Marga. Are there any other board member comments? Okay. 
uh, using the F, I'm sorry, E, uh, future agenda items. Uh, I'd like to put one in that is with the rezoning that's going to happen, mm -hmm. some sort of actual determination from, I don't know if it's the clerk or the city attorney's office. Uh, I do know that people who currently live in Ward 1 are now joining the Ward 2 NAB. Um, so just an official, what do we, you know, from the city, what's the guideline there? Mm -hmm. So that would be nice to, to hear what the what the rules are. <laughs> the rules. And that. Okay. Jerry. Is the public input for the changes to Barbara Bennett? Are finished. Is there a feedback from that process? I don't know off the top of my head, but I'll reach out to the Parks Department and see if it's still open or if it's finished. And either way, ask for an update. If it's open, I'll let all of you know. Um, and if they have the results, I'll ask them to come and see if they can present the findings. Yeah, I've not seen, I'm in the Parks Commission, I've not seen any like update on those findings. Yeah. Yeah, so an update on those would be good. Mm -hmm. All right. And dovetail with him. That survey was horrendous. I mean, I have I have never seen anything so intricate and involved where you had to have different computer. I mean, I, mm -hmm. at some point I lost it. Right. Oh. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> no, it's okay. And that's my part. You're right there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 All right. Um, we'll consider that public comment. I did. Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> the public comment for the record. All right. Is there any other public comment in the room? Yes, ma'am. I was just like to see. Um, Can you please state your name for the record? Sorry. Jessica Glover from Ward 1. Um, I would like to see more um, safety implements for the RTC uh, for passengers riding. Um, trans public transit. Um, a lot of times, um, there's security at the downtown uh, Centennial Plaza, and um, but there's not actual security for passengers riding. And um, I just want to make it safer to have this right. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room who'd like to give a closing public comment on today's meeting? Seeing none, is there anyone on Zoom who'd like to give a closing public comment on today's meeting? If you'd like to give comment by Zoom, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Mr. Chair, we have no closing public comment. All right. Who's in Jeremy? Can I get a motion? So moved. All right. That's it. Second. Jerry. Pleasure. Jerry. And I'll all uh, approve. Aye. Or all agree. Aye. <laughs> all in favor. Thank you. Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? <laughs> Hearing none. Yes. Yeah, Thank you.